Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing today? My name is Katie. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm here to welcome you to today's MOS Live program, which is a virtual planetarium checking out the sky tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to let you know that if you are joining us from Facebook or YouTube, uh, we really appreciate you being here, but we cannot see your questions or comments at this time. Uh, if you can register ahead of time and join us on Zoom, or if you're on Zoom right now, you can head to the bottom. There's a Q&A box there, and you can type your questions to our educator there. If you'd like to see closed captioning, there is also a button at the bottom that says CC, which you can click to see the closed captioning. So at this point, I invite our educator to turn on their camera and join us. Hello. My name is Chuck, and I hope you're all doing well today and staying safe. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I will be leading you through the night sky tonight as a tour of the night sky, the wonderful sights that can be seen, um, and uh, both early in the evening, as well as a very interesting collection of planets that's visible in the pre-dawn sky, as well as telling you about any upcoming sky events that are going to be going on. With that, I would like to start our software, which is called Stellarium. It's a piece of software that you can download and use on your own to learn about the night sky, except this is the guided tour that I'll be conducting using Stellarium. So let's go ahead and start Stellarium. And this is what it looks like when you open the software. And it is a nice cloudless sky. As we like to say, it's always clear in the planetarium and it's always clear in Stellarium. And so we're looking at the sky the way it looks right now. And uh, obviously we can't show you the, the night sky right now because the sun is in the sky and its light is being scattered about by the atmosphere. Uh, that's why we have a blue sky. We have a scattering effect of the sunlight in the atmosphere and the sun is very bright. It's over a, it's 100,000 times as bright as the full moon. What that means is it pours a lot of light in the sky and it's light is scattered around. So much you can't see stars. So uh, we're here to see stars and planets and other things in the sky. So what I'd like to do is to move time ahead a little bit and have this handy dandy window. Uh, this is a, uh, what I've chosen for a background is a field might, much like what you might have around here. And so for looking at the night sky, a uh, good place to uh, go is in a field like this, anywhere you have a wide open view of the sky, perhaps near where you live, you have a field. I grew up in a place where I had a field in back of my house, and it was a great place to go and observe the night sky from. So get to a place that's as wide open as possible. A lot of the things that are going to be happening in the sky this, this uh, year are going to be uh, in a place where you need a low horizon to see them. If the events that are going to be low in the sky, you need to have a clear western or eastern horizon at, sun, at sunrise, western horizon at sunset. So it makes sense to have not a lot of, not any trees or houses or buildings in the way. So having said that, let's go ahead and move time ahead. And as we do that, I'm slowly making the sunset. I have such control over the universe here. Don't you agree, Katie? Uh, anyway, so... I don't know if you had total control. I think I'd ask you to have the sunset later and later. Oh, yeah. Well, well, that, that can happen. I'm going to show you that, as a matter of fact, show you what's going to be happening uh, in the next month. We are now moving on to about 6 o'clock, uh, to 4 o'clock, 4.30, 5 o'clock. Let's stop time right about here. Sun's just about to set. Sets at about 5.35, 5.40 this time. Remember when it was dark just after four o'clock a couple months ago in December? We have progressed a lot since then. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me move, uh, let me step days ahead. I'm going to keep the time now at about five o'clock and I'm going to move days ahead to the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. So you see I'm counting up days. And you see at the same time, at five o'clock, the sun is actually higher above the horizon. And a week, uh, th this, uh, this weekend, I believe, or it's next weekend, that we move ahead to daylight savings time. What that's going to mean is that when we do this, and I believe this is on Sunday the 14th, we are going to go ahead and uh, move our clocks ahead. What that means is that 
instead of the sun setting at 540, it's all of a sudden going to set at 645. It'll be dark almost up. It'll be light up almost up until about seven o'clock. And you notice that our time moved ahead from 17 to 18 hours. The software automatically corrects for the imposition of daylight savings time. So by the end of the month, it will be light up until just about seven o'clock. And that will be nice for us all. That just means we have to wait until about 7.45 or so or eight o'clock to be able to see the night sky. But the nights will be warmer, which is a great compensation for that. Let's go ahead and watch the sun set and see what can be seen in the sky. I'm going to move it back to today's date, by the way, just so we're not confused. We see it's in the sky tonight. So maybe, yeah. And moving time ahead to six and then 6.30 and let's watch the stars come out. I think this program among others has the great, the best twilight uh, and quality of the daytime, of the nighttime sky. So this is what we'll see at about 740 or so. And I am deliberately not showing you very much because this is what you're going to see in the city. The second rule of thumb that I'm going to say about observing the night sky is get as far away from city lights as you can. Near any major city, and Boston is no exception, we have uh, millions of people living in this area. And they all do things at night. We all get out and drive at night or uh, we might uh, go out. You need The point is you need uh, out light for outdoor activity. So we have all these building lights, street uh, lights. We have ballparks, airports, parking lots, things like that, all of, and factories and things, all of which are lit up and provide us with um, a really not very good view of the night sky. This is about as many stars as you'll see from the city and that's it. But we'd like to point out more. So go ahead and take down the light pollution and uh, I have a window of doing that. So let's go ahead, show you what you would see from, oh, Northern New England somewhere, a lot better. You'll see many more stars that come into view. And we're showing you again, the Western sky. And at this time of the year, at this time of the night, it's dominated by a bunch of very bright stars and we've labeled some of them for you. Uh, and chief among those star patterns, we'll be talking a lot about star patterns and constellations. And by the way, I'll also be stopping every once in a while. So if you have a question, feel free to ask it and we'll try to pick it up in the chat. So here we are at about quarter of eight at night and we have the three bright stars of what constellation? I'm actually gonna put this as a quiz. And so if you know the name of the constellation, well, you have three bright stars in a row that mark the belt, almost a dead giveaway there, mark the belt of this famous hunter, put it in the chat. And uh, Katie, do we have any answers coming in? Yeah, let's see what's coming in. Uh, we have our first for Orion. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you guess, yeah, go ahead. Are there more? Oh, I was going to say uh, another guess for O'Brien, a little, <laughs> little <O 'Brien>. variation. <laughs> yeah, O'Brien, why not? So that is, this is in fact the constellation of Orion. And Orion is a famous hunter in Greek mythology. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can get a better view of him. And uh, Orion has two stars, Betelgeuse and Bellatrix that mark his shoulders, three in a row form his belt, the famous Orion's belt, and then two more locate the hunter's legs. Now, Orion is a constellation from Greek mythology, uh, imagined thousands of years ago by the ancient Greeks. And um, notice something about the uh, some of the stars in Orion. The star marked Betelgeuse and the star marked Rigel. Do you notice any difference between those two stars? Go ahead and put it in the chat difference between Betelgeuse and Rigel. Any differences that you can see just by observing? Looking for differences. Um, maybe how close the stars and the planets are to each other. It's a guess. There is, if you look at Betelgeuse and if you look at Rigel, you will see a different difference between them. They're about the same brightness, but there is a difference between them. On the screen. Different colors? Yes. You notice the different colors? 
You know, so Beetlejuice is kind of reddish and Rigel is kind of bluish. Now, astronomy is a cool science, but you really can't go out and do experiments in the star. If you want to find out about the star, you can't go out and stick a thermometer in it. You can't go out and measure it with a ruler. Uh, you can't go out and take a test tube of its material and see what kind of stuff it's made of. Uh, but you can analyze its light to tell its temperature. And that is what we can tell by a star's color. A star's color tells its temperature. Uh, so which star do you think is hotter? The red star, Betelgeuse, or the blue star, Rigel? I'll give you a minute I'm to guess. thinking of a, the hotter star between those two. Right. We have more guesses for blue, for the blue star. Okay, and uh, that is in fact what it is. Uh, you might think of red as a hot color. I mean, our faucets here, our water faucets here on earth often have a red dot for hot water and a blue dot for cold water. Uh, and our weather maps have red colors for hot temperatures and blue colors for cold. In stars, it's the other way around. Anything that is hot enough to make its own light, it has to be thousands of degrees to make its own light. Anything that makes its own light, unless it's a uh, one of those glow sticks or a firefly or anything like that, it's hot. Betelgeuse is thousands of degrees. It's about 5,000 degrees on its surface, but Rigel is hotter on the surface. It's about 10,000 degrees. And all these stars are basically huge glowing balls of gas that are powered in their interior by immense and tremendously powerful nuclear reactions. Rigel has hotter reactions inside it uh, that are going on. And uh, so it has a blue color, which gives its surface temperature actually of about uh, more like 40, 50,000 degrees, something like that. Our sun has a yellow color, which means it's kind of in the middle. It's hot, but its surface temperature is about 10,000 degrees. So that's some interesting things about Orion the hunter. And Orion as a mythological creature has something very interesting in it. You may have noticed, picked up on the fact that hanging below the belt is kind of this fuzzy blob. And there are lots of fuzzy blobs in the sky. Astronomers love to look at them with telescopes. And this particular fuzzy blob is one of your favorite sites if you like to look through telescopes. And of course, there are lots of things you can look at through telescopes, planets and galaxies and so forth. Nebulas are things that you can see too. And if you have a fairly mid-sized telescope, one six inches or so in diameter, that and you might see, let's zoom in on that object and see what it is. That is a glowing cloud of gas. Now you are not gonna see anything like this in your telescope. This is uh, an actually photograph superimposed on our sky map taken by an observatory telescope. But I just wanted to show you that it is there. It is a, re it is a cloud of gas called a nebula, glowing cloud of gas. Uh, and it is being lit up by four bright stars that have just formed inside the nebula. It is a place where stars are being born, literally a stellar nursery. Our sun formed out of a big cloud of gas as well, billions of years ago. And along with that, the earth and all of the other planets in the solar system. We've got these big clouds of, of gas hanging out in space. Some of them, that gas is coming together, collapsing, condensing under its own gravity, that gas is pulled together and it may take millions of years to do this, huge cloud of gas. But eventually you get stars forming there, which are giant nuclear reactors that develop temperatures of tens of millions of degrees inside them, all because of gravitational collapse. As I said, it takes millions of years to do that. So favorite object among astronomers, you will see a little fuzz around one of those stars in what's called the Sword of Orion. There are three or four groups of stars hanging below the belt there. The, sec the second group from the bottom is that Orion Nebula. Back to stories and mythology about the stars. And so we have Orion surrounded by some of his, uh, some of the other constellations in a group of stars called the Winter Circle. So we're taking a really wide view of the sky. And we'll see that Betelgeuse and Orion is surrounded by kind of an oval shape or roughly circular shape 
of bright named stars and other constellations. Near Orion is one of his two hunting dogs, Canis Major the Big Dog. And Canis Major the Big Dog looks something like that. So there's Orion with his large hunting dog, Canis Major. Now, any of you listen to Sirius satellite radio? You may have had it offered to you when you bought your car and then the radio and you get an offer for Sirius satellite radio. You remember seeing a logo that Sirius has, the company Sirius has is this logo, and that is a dog with a star in his eye. Look familiar? In fact, Sirius is called the dog star, and it marks the head of Canis Major, the big dog, and it is bright, the brightest star in the sky. I should really say that it is the brightest looking star in the sky. No other star looks as bright as it does. Planets may be brighter than look brighter in the sky than Sirius does, but Sirius is one of the closest stars in the sky. Let's compare it, for example, let's draw back a little bit and compare it with Rigel, the star in the foot, the blue star in the foot of Orion. You can see that Sirius and Rigel definitely differ in brightness. Sirius looks brighter. What if I told you that Rigel is about a thousand times as bright as Sirius? It is about a thousand times as bright as Sirius. So why doesn't it look as bright as Sirius in the sky? Go ahead and put it in the chat if you have a guess about why a star that is really brighter can look not as bright. There's something else that influences a star's brightness. Maybe distance. Now we're getting it to guess some distance, and that is a good guess. That is in fact correct. Stars aren't all the same distance away from us. Some stars, uh, Rigel is way farther away from us than Sirius is. And so it looks not quite as bright. If you moved Rigel up as close to Sirius is to the a star, uh, to, to us as the um, as Sirius is, if you made them both the same distance away from the earth, you'd see that Rigel way outside shines Sirius. As a matter of fact, you would not have, you would not have nighttime here on the earth if you moved Rigel in to as close to us as Sirius is and a few other constellations nearby. There is another dog as well. See the star Procyon up here above, above uh, Sirius and a little bit to the left is the star Procyon in the constellation of Canis Minor, the little dog, the little dog there. Do you see a little dog? Okay, do you see a hot dog? That's about all I see. And so that combined with Pollux and Castor, a pair of stars above Procyon, very high up overhead, in the two twin brothers, Gemini. And then on the other side of Orion, two interesting things right here. See Aldebaran in the face of the bull, Taurus. A V-shaped grouping of stars right to the right of Orion marks his face and eyes. And Aldebaran is the red star, again, cooler than the sun, so it has a reddish color, is the right angry eye of Aldebaran, uh, of Taurus, glaring at Orion. In fact, they're doing battle in the sky. Nearby is something that might be confused with Aldebaran. It is a planet, Mars. It is almost the same color and almost the same brightness right now. So it, you might be forgiven for mixing the two of these up. Uh, however, if you look at Mars over the course of the next few days, let's go ahead and do that, you'll notice something interesting about Mars. Right now, it is near a cluster of stars called the Pleiades, which is a neat cluster of stars to look at, especially towards, through a telescope, but you can see it with the naked eye. Let's move, step forward one day at a time and see what's interesting about Mars. You notice it's moving against the background of stars. So we're keeping at the same time, about 10 minutes to seven every night, but moving the nights ahead, see that Mars is moving. Planets are called were called wandering stars in ancient times. They're really not stars at all. They're planets orbiting the sun, getting the sun's light, so that's why they shine. But they are they move against the background of stars, and there are five of these. Ancient Greeks noticed that there were five star-like objects that look like stars. But, but yet moved and drifted against the background of stars. So the same planet might be in a different place in the sky next week or next month or next year. So we're given the name planetos, which means wanderers. And so that's how we get the name planet. 
So interesting things going on in the evening sky. Our red letters, by the way, in the center of the screen indicate what, what direction we're, uh, we're facing. So we've been looking at the west and in the southwestern part of the sky. Coming up in the east part of the sky is a symbol of spring. And that is this constellation right here, Leo the lion. Kind of looks like a lion. You just kind of see the head and mane, a star marking his chest or heart. Lion's back quarter, uh, hind quarters, and tail right there. So Leo the lion, the symbol of spring coming up in the eastern sky. I'd like to go ahead and step time ahead toward the early morning hours. Is there something I want to catch in the early morning? We have Mars in the sky right now as our planet, but that's the only one. If we want to see more planets, we need to wait until before sunrise. And we have planets coming up. We've now moved time ahead to six o'clock in the morning. Things look very different. Our, if we look back over toward the Southwest, our wintertime stars have disappeared. Even Leo, which was in the Southeastern sky, is setting in the West. And you notice it's getting a little brighter, brighter over there in the Eastern sky. And we have two planets, Jupiter and Saturn. There are other planets in the sky, uh, Mercury as well, and Venus, but they're not really visible right now. It's, they're kind of too close to the sun to be seen. By the time they rise, it's kind of bright in the sky and it's hard to see them. So Jupiter and Saturn, and Jupiter and Saturn were really famous last uh, December because they got really close together in the sky. As you can see, they're not really close together in the sky. Uh, they were so close together in the sky, by the way, at the end of December, that my arrow here in the cursor could easily have uh, covered up both planets together. They were that close in the sky. They've drifted apart. And uh, they will continue to drift apart for about the next 10 years or so. And then slowly over the course of 10 years after that, come back together. So we get one of these conjunctions, these close apparitions of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, but what, about once every 20 years. But don't feel bad if you miss the December 21st conjunction. They still make a pretty pair, interesting pair uh, in the sky. And with that, I'd like to open it for general questions that people might have about the night sky, anything at all. We did have a few come in. Um, we have one that says, why does the sun set at different spots on the horizon during the year? And what are good spots for star viewing near Boston if you don't have a car? If you don't have a car, if you live, I'll answer the second question first. If you don't have a car and if you are in the city, well, uh, the top of our Museum of Science garage, except I don't know if that's really available now because of closing restrictions and so forth. But there is a park down the river. There is a ballpark at the Esplanade uh, between the museums. If you look at the river, if you're at the museum, you look down the river, you see the Longfellow Bridge. In between the bridge and us here in the museum, on the left-hand side, on the left bank, on the Boston side, near Starrow Drive, is a good place to see the sky from, and that is the Esplanade. There's a ball field out there. And there's the Oval, of course, where the Hat Shell is, where the Boston Pops uh, plays the 4th of July concert and, and other groups play concerts as well. So that's a good place. But any ball field, um, uh, it, it would be a good place. If your neighborhood has a baseball diamond or so forth, that would be a good place. Or the top of the building. Now, in terms of why the sun sets at different times during the year, um, and it all, it's basically the same phenomenon that gives us earlier sunsets at some time of the year, later sunsets at other times of the year. Let me go ahead and step back to sunset just to illustrate there. So right now, at this time of the year, to illustrate what the, what the questioner is talking about, uh, so we are here on the 13th of March. See the sun in the sky. So here we've got the sun uh, setting almost in the west. So this time of the year, the sun sets almost directly in the west. We turn ahead to summer, it was set way over to the right of west. 
but still in the western part of the sky to the north and west. In the winter, it sets way to the southwest. Why does that happen? It has to do with the tilt of the Earth. Uh, as Because the Earth is tilted, that's what gives us our seasons. We're approaching the time of the year when the North Pole of the Earth has the greatest tilt towards the sun. Well, the Earth is moving in its orbit so the sunlight is falling more in the northern hemisphere. Atmosphere. We're going to have a higher sun, longer days. The path of the sun throughout the sky is going to be higher and higher. And that means that this, because the sun is shining more directly on the northern hemisphere, when it sets, it's going to be to the northern, uh, in the northward direction from west. In near the winter solstice in December, the southern hemisphere of the earth gets favored with sunlight, and the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. And that causes the sun set point to migrate more to the left or to the south of west. Other questions? Great, thank you. Uh, speaking of the sun, which is a star, uh, Naomi, who is four and a half, wants to know, are stars close to planets? Are stars close to planets? Well, the planets that we can see in our solar system are... You might say they're close to the sun, but when I use the word close in space, that's kind of a tough word because when we think about all of space, yeah, the earth is close to the sun, but it's still 93 million miles away from the sun. And that's a lot of miles. So when we say something is close to something else in space, that means it's close compared to the whole galaxy or to all of space. So the sun is, the earth is one of the closest objects to the sun. Planets, can be billions of miles away from the sun, but they're still really close to the sun. Other stars are trillions of miles away. I know I'm talking about really, really big numbers. Astronomy is a science where there's a lot of big numbers in it. So yes, the earth and other planets are close to the sun. Other uh, stars have planets that are close to them. We know this now, we found thousands of them now. And so, um, our planets are close to the sun, but other stars are far away, much farther away. Maybe that's what you're getting at. I don't know. It seems like it's a little more complicated than it might look on my yeah. small laptop screen right now. Yes. Well, with that, I think we are out of time. So uh, I do want to say thank you to Chuck for taking us on a tour of tonight's sky. You're welcome. Enjoy looking at the night sky. Um, great. So thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate being here. We appreciate your hypotheses and your questions. Thanks for being such wonderful scientists with us. If you would like to continue that, I've put the link here for the program that Chuck was using. It's called Stellarium, and you can actually use it at home yourself. So you can explore tonight's sky from Boston, or if you're joining us from somewhere else, uh, you can actually enter that in as well and see what's going on. Uh, if you'd like to join us for more and different op uh, different offerings, you can visit mos.org slash mos at home to see what we are up to online. Uh, and of course, if you enjoyed today's program, please consider supporting us by visiting engage.mos.org slash welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful Friday.